Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Country Music Armadillo Show. Our guest this week is one of the most soulful individuals I've ever seen, Justin Wells. Justin, you've got a brand new album out. I know you're just as busy as can be right now. Thanks for taking the time to stop and join us here this evening. I really appreciate it. Hey, man. Thanks for having me, Vince. So, for those of you who don't know, uh, Justin was the the former one of the former vocalists for a band, Fifth on the Floor, out of Lexington, Kentucky, and Fifth on the Floor had a, a pretty good run. Um, you guys opened up for for George Thorogood and, and several other acts, and and you had a record produced by Shooter Jennings, and eventually Fifth on the Floor, you guys decided to go separate ways. So, go ahead and tell us how you first got your start into music leading up to getting into fifth on the floor. Um, it's a pretty, I mean, it's a somewhat quick story. Uh, I, I started playing music in like junior high and I've been in two bands in my life. And, uh, the first one was like a Metallica cover band in high school. And the second one was fifth on the floor, you know, kind of, I, I screwed around in a, smaller town in southern kentucky did a little bit of college and a lot of bit of drinking and uh played solo shows i was writing music but i moved to lexington in 2005 i wanted to start a band and within a year i'd started fifth on the floor uh, which is kind of a very different fifth on the floor than people got to know you know in the decade or you know a little under a decade that we were a band um but yeah, so I mean, that was the only other band I'd ever been in. I think, you know, um, I was pretty naive because of that and a lot of things. And, you know, we kind of, we kind of essentially beat a, you know, bar band, drinking band, um, you know, four hour bullshit gig, you know, playing every small ass honky tonk in the region and, you know, yeah, you spend. Guys- Definitely then, took the hard way coming up. Oh yeah, man. I mean, I know that other other people and certainly other of my peers have been doing it a lot longer than me, but I I can't imagine that many people have done it a lot a lot dumber than we did. <laughs> we just went at it, man. We didn't, you know. Uh, uh, you know, you speak to having a good run at it. I think we did have a good run at it, but a, a lot of people were only aware of us in the last two years of you know a nine year run. Sure. So. You know, and we weren't we weren't not playing. I mean, music music has been my sole income for you know <laughs> over the time of that band. So, so as you guys, and and I don't want to talk a lot about Fifth on the Floor because you know we're focusing on you, and and my hope is to someday get all you guys together for kind of a post Fifth on the Floor interview. <laughs> even though I know that will probably never happen, but I'm shooting for the stars, right? Nobody knows where those dudes are. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, yeah, no. Uh, honestly, yeah, I'm I'm always happy to talk about Fifth on the Floor. I mean, I started that band. I wrote most of the songs. I sang most of the songs, and you know, frankly, this new record uh, has a lot to do with the band. It's it's not something that uh, is behind me or anything like that necessarily. I mean, I'm not out here playing Fifth on the Floor songs either, but you know sure that's 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 been that i'm i'm fiercely proud of the work that we did so now okay when you've got that drunk guy in the audience who keeps hollering for fifth on the floor songs does that bother you uh man yes and no i mean you know kind of speaking to what i just said that you know in my mind anyway there were there were like three different fifth on the floors in that period there were some significant changes in three very distinct periods in my mind and each each one of those periods you know we grew and uh and we moved past a lot of material that we kind of i mean there's definitely there, there's an album that that's been out of circulation a long time that i i really cringed through a lot of it if i had to hear it today but but there's still stuff on that that's really cool so you know it was like that every period and so now i mean you know if somebody hollers out something that was kind of a more obscure song you know in a way that's cool but and i don't you know it's not like i'm never going to play fifth on the floor songs again 
but uh you know we did that that was a band man you know yeah it, I I was the one who people saw the most of, but th- that's just because I'm a big motherfucker. <laughs> Can we pass on this? Did I just violate a? No, I that's I I have no standards. So <clears throat> big um, motherfucker. <laughs> well, it's the truth. That's the thing. Uh, the first time I saw you, um, actually, I I didn't know who you were, and you walked out on stage, and I thought you were a guitar tech, and. <laughs> I'm like, you started singing, and it was just, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, we got something going on here. Just totally. That? Uh, that was when you opened for Cody in Newport last fall. I was, I, I was late to fifth on the floor, and despite you guys being local to the area, I had just, I had never seen you before, and. You know, we were sitting there, and I, I was talking to a couple of friends that we knew, and I, I was leaning back against the stage with my back on the stage, and, you know, I, I looked over my shoulder when you came out, and I thought, well, this guy's just out here to set everything up, and then you started singing, I, whoa, hey, wait a minute, guys, and I could not turn around for the rest of the night, so thank you. you captivated me right off the bat, and I've been drinking the Kool-Aid ever since, That's so cool. let's go back to the end of Fifth on the Floor, so everything's coming to a close and you guys have decided to go your separate ways. Was there ever any question as to what your next move would be? Was there ever a time where you're like, well, maybe I'll start a, an all night pancake restaurant here in Lexington or was, did you know that you were going to start your own solo career? I mean, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, a couple things here. I mean, you know, I don't know that how long I can, I certainly never considered an alternative uh, that was specific to anything. Um, and, and I'm not sure that I would ever even have given a second thought to, to doing anything other than music where I'm not a father and, you know, having, having my girls dependent on me, you know, I, I just think, I mean, I, I, I'm committed to music always have been, but I'm, I'm more committed to those little girls. So, you know, I think because of that, that, that was, of course, that was, that was forefront of my mind. I mean, you know, it felt like to me you know, without being too corny, it felt like a marriage, man, and kind of a dissolution of a, of a marriage. I mean, sure. I, I was in that band longer than any relationship I've ever been in. And, and it, you know, it was, I don't know, man. I mean, it was absolutely heartbreaking to me and I imagine it was for the guys too. Uh, you know, so coming off of that, I mean, I just, I mean, I really just started writing and that's mostly what everybody's listening to right now. Hopefully, as many people as possible. Absolutely. You've got your new album out, Dawn in the Distance. Great stuff. It lived up to the hype. I, I put it out to everybody that I know because, like I said, I've been captivated. So this new album, it, it's it's been very personal to you, and following your Facebook page, it's it's very fun because you've posted a lot of, of stories about what it means to you. And, and after reading these stories, there's really no doubt that this is one of the most important things that you feel you've ever done. So kind of how important is it to you in your words? Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think that I will never be, uh, I can't imagine that I'll ever be this personal on a record again i mean never say never but um you know fifth on the floor kind of existed somewhat in this like you know people certainly try to categorize us as as you know southern rock or or outlaw or whatever uh never you know never anything that we claimed we never claimed that we never claimed americana or any of that shit but you know i think that comes with a lot of that kind of like underground country um whatever there's this sort of like big badass bullshit persona that I don't know. I just felt like we found ourselves in. I never felt like my songs in that band were, were that, you know, it's not a lot of the, and I'm not knocking anybody, but it's not a lot of the uh, stereotypical kind of, you know, uh, aggro dude things, you know? Um, but I was, you know, whatever, I was fine with that, but I, I just felt like, okay, here's all this shit on my chest 
that I'm writing about that is deeply personal. It's not very metaphorical. I mean, it's pretty obvious. All these songs, I feel like, are pretty obvious. Um, so I just, I don't know. It's almost like rebelling against that in a way. You know, man? I mean, I've got I've got a lot of songwriting heroes that are shared with a lot of these artists. But I thought those dudes were cool, and I think that some guys these days take that whole Billy Badass thing a little too far. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah I, I will agree with you that that does the get carried, person, carried I'm not out sometimes. First to say any of this, but you know, <laughs> no, no, you're fine. So it was. It, it's really kind of a. You put your whole heart into it because it was kind of in a way like. I can do this without fifth on the floor and stand on my own. It was more a way of, uh, I just came out of emotionally, you know, a breakup of sorts. I mean, this thing that I loved is, is, is gone. And I was the biggest fan of it, of anybody. And I'm the most bummed out as anybody. And I'm writing a record about that. I'm writing a record about the road and how it's, you know, kicked my teeth in and, I'm writing a record about missing my little girls and my wife when I'm gone, you know? Uh, so it was all that. I don't know. I, I don't, you know, country music is kind of always been this sad thing. Uh, you know, we, it's, it's okay for us to feel we don't have to be, <laughs> you know, yeah. we, we don't have to be impenetrable walls. Uh, and I say we, I mean, you know, there, there, I'm very influenced by country. I love country music. And I think that I write some country music. I don't know that I'm comfortable calling the record country, but uh, other people do. And that's fine. Yeah. It it falls into that wide spectrum right now where, you know, I mean, people don't like what's coming out of Nashville. So we're, we're looking at the alternative, but you know, I, Nick Dittmeyer and I were discussing just last week that, you know, alternative country is, is not the cool term anymore. And, I mean, Americana is is the big blanket term, but, you know, there is so much encompassed in Americana that, mm, what is Americana, really? So, it, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, you've, you've had a lot of uh, posts about, you know, the musicians that were playing on the album with you and, and on the road with you. So, talk about those guys a little bit and what they have done for you. Well, uh, so the musicians on the record, um, at least, uh, t- so my band were Tommy Nato or Tom Nato. I just called him Tommy and I've literally never called him Tommy in my life. Uh, <laughs> Blake Cox and Robbie Casenza and, uh, Robbie and Tom were in a band for years, a kind of like indie rock thing called these United States that, uh, had definitely had some success. Uh, they're in a band now that, um, I guess you could put a, up under that Americana massive umbrella called Van Devere. Very fantastic songwriting in that band. Um, and Blake's been in a few projects over the years, et cetera. And, and um, I'd done a couple of shows towards the end of fifth on the floor with Tom. Tom actually produced our last little kind of breakup EP, this little four song EP that we did when we knew we were, we were calling it quits, you know, um, he produced it and played the pedal steel on it and stuff. And so, uh, I went back to the studio that he produces at and works at and the owner of the studio, a guy named Dwayne Lundy, uh, who's produced, uh, amongst any number of other things, he produced the Sunday Valley record that I'm a big, big fan of always been a big fan. Um, and we just started talking, man. And what, what I knew I wanted to do. And I think what Dwayne wanted to do too, is just a not, not make a fifth on the floor record without fifth on the floor. B, not make a fifth on the floor light, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and not really pursue any of the past that, you know, even, even though all this, you know, I guess the, the, the thing to beat up on is the country music coming out of Nashville, but God bless, there's so much good music coming out of Nashville that, that is definitely on the radar now that it, it almost feels shitty, like we're punching down when we make fun of. (laughs) <laughs> some of those pop country acts because there's so much good stuff, you know? Sure. Uh, that's, that's my message. I don't, I don't pay attention to any of that stuff. I want to, I want people to hear what's good and not focus on what's not. So I just, uh, you know, we just, we just didn't want to do that. And, and 
I'm not saying that, you know, the sounds on my record have never been heard before. Quite the opposite. I think we just went back 30 years. And, I mean, hell, we looked we looked as much at as Fleetwood Mac as we did anything from Waylon or any of that, you know? Mm-hmm. This was a country band. This, this band of guys were very capable in that regard, but they weren't a country uh, musicians, you know? We had a, a, a female <laughs> choir, you know? We had... Oh, there's a daggone glockenspiel on the record. I mean, I, I just, <laughs> you know, we weren't doing any of that. We weren't doing any, anything just to do it. Everything was to serve the song. That was, that was what we were slaves to. And, and I, I'm proud of how it worked out. I, absolutely. And it's, it's a great record. It's a good time record. You listen to it and it, it just, it, it uplifts you. I mean, it, it's, I just can't say enough about how much of a good time record it really is. So we're going to go ahead and take a break. Uh, I'm, I'm going to play one of your songs from, from the new record, uh, the, the lead single from it, Going Down Grinning. And when we come back, uh, we're, we're going to talk about some more things that I really admire about you, including something that I've never never seen before and, and never seen since. So uh, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, We'll have more with Justin. I thought I did good, but you be the judge. I closed that door and bid back the grudge. Like a woman. Oh 
Hey, we want to thank the Outlaw Convention on Facebook for helping sponsor this week's show. Look them up on Facebook, facebook facebook.com, the Outlaw Convention. They play a lot of good songs, keep up with a lot of good artists. Thank you to those guys for, for helping sponsor this show. So, back with Justin Wells now, and <clears throat> you do something that just, it blew my mind the first time I saw it. You came out, and you stepped away from the microphone and started singing to a room of people who, you know, were, were kind of loud at that point, and you start singing without this microphone, and you're just as loud without the microphone as you are with it. <laughs> And the entire room shut the hell up and <laughs> was just pulled in by that. And, you know, that was that was kind of a small room, the upstairs room at the Southgate house. And I thought, okay, maybe that was just, you know, a one-time thing, the small room. But I seen you open for Shooter Jennings in Louisville in March at Headliners Music Hall, which is a, a much, much bigger room. And you did the same thing and... The same result. Everybody shut their mouths, and all eyes were on you. Where did you learn that? <laughs> well, that realistically, probably that that band I told you about in high school that we practiced in my drummer's uh, little shitty room, and and we were playing through half stacks and just thinking we were going to be the next Metallica and playing way too damn loud, and me having to sing over all that. But uh, you know, man, I, that on top of that you know uh you know fifth on the floor was not a quiet band and uh i never had to do too much of that we weren't you know i kind of like to joke about it sometimes but we weren't a band that you could really talk over uh i'm these songs are a lot more intimate some of them a lot slower uh some of them arguably sadder and uh i you know i'm not gonna pitch a fit about it and i'm not gonna be an asshole on the mic and tell everybody to shut the fuck up. But, you know, there's certainly times that any artist that gives a shit about the songs they're singing feels that way. If a crowd is rude. Now that said, those two experiences that you first saw me in was, you know, me playing in front of a crowd of most, if not all of whom hadn't heard of me, you know? And so, uh, in that situation, I guess it's a little more, a uh, chip on your shoulder, man. I mean, we did so many years of touring prior to having an agent, prior to having management, prior to having any label backing or any, any radio or any of that, where we're every single night, man, for, you know, 10 weeks at a time, every single night we're walking to a room and nobody gives a shit about us every single, every single night. So there's, there's a, a you know, some sort of chip on your shoulder that comes out of that and you know it's just i don't know man it's just uh you gotta (laughs) get their attention at the first and maybe they'll just drink their beer and keep their damn phones in their pockets and enjoy the show no you you got my full support on that i i hate when people are talking and and because you know they're never talking they're screaming so shut up and watch the show you paid for a ticket Watch the show. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story here. Just And it's not a problem you're dealing with. I was fortunate enough last fall to get a ticket here in uh, Bloomington, Indiana to see Willie Nelson and Merle Haggard at a 5,000-seat auditorium. And uh, Merle and, and Willie came out and played for a little bit. Then Merle played a set, and then Merle and Willie came back out. And then they took an intermission so they could change the stage over from Merle's band to Willie's. Well, these three guys came down from up top and sat down behind me, and Willie Nelson comes out and starts playing his set. And these guys are still carrying on a conversation. And, you know, I was like, okay, they're just finishing their conversation up. I'm not going to say anything. And, of course, I was was probably 7,500 yards from the stage, so I could hear every word they were saying, clearly. And they just kept talking. And the fifth song in, Willie Nelson is up there playing Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain. And these jackasses behind me are talking about this guy's home improvement project that he's got to do this weekend. He's talking, oh, I got to stand in bar stools this weekend. I'm not looking forward to it. And something in my head snapped. And I'm usually a really calm and, and really, you know, I'm, I'm very polite. But I turned around and I just, I said, hey, out of respect for the music, would you shut the fuck up? 
That is Willie Nelson down there on stage. I don't want to listen to you talk about sand in a bar stool when Willie fucking Nelson is on stage down there. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, it's not just a problem for you, but you yeah. handle it so much better than a lot of people. And well, there's, I think that there's a couple things at play for, for, you know, firstly, I don't think that it's anything new. I think, you know, drunk people have been drunk people or loud mouth people have been loud mouth people always. I can't imagine it was ever any different, but I also think, you know, it's incumbent a little bit on the performer in, in a way, not necessarily to shush people, but at least to, you know, I, I don't know if you, if you put out there that that's not tolerable, uh, a lot of times that'll work in your favor. You know, a great example, a guy named John Moreland, I'm sure you're very familiar with one mm -hmm. of the best writers doing it right now. I mean, maybe the best, honestly, John deserves that. Uh, I saw him in a room that was somewhat listening room, somewhat honky tonk, maybe a hundred cap, not a, not a large room. And there was just uh, like, you know, John's pretty quiet, plays by himself and, you know, but very captivating, very powerful. And there was about, I don't know, man, like a little three person conversation that kind of kept kicking up. And John silenced him with a look, man, didn't ever raise his voice. Nothing. Just just acknowledged with a look that they were forgetting their manners and they remembered them. And that was the end of it. Nobody had to be embarrassed. And that's my thing. I, you know, I don't ever want to embarrass anybody. I'm I'm very appreciative of anybody that's spent money on me, uh, whether they want to talk through it or not, that kind of sucks. But, uh, you know, I don't want to belittle anybody or embarrass anybody, you know, it's just like a teacher in a class or something. If a teacher calls little Johnny a fuck wit, that <laughs> little Johnny's going to hate that teacher and little Johnny's not going to learn a damn thing from that teacher. You know, I'm not saying I'm a teacher, I'm just saying that I don't know. I try to find a way to do it respectfully if <laughs> you know that's my plan a and then plan b who knows <laughs> uh, you know I, I i don't know if i've mentioned your size but you are i, I called you a dinosaur when i was talking <laughs> with mary spar last week and <laughs> that's, that's really old <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really kind of accurate i mean you're you're a big guy. I, I wouldn't want to piss you off because, you know, I'm six foot and you've got almost a foot on me and, you know, probably pushing a hundred pounds. So you've got that imposing size. So, you know, if you, uh, all you'd have to do is <clears throat> just look angry and I'm sure that would go a long way too. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it's, if it's helped me on stage. I know, and you know, years ago, it certainly helped me when it, in the back of some shady ass joint trying to get paid <laughs> we never had a problem getting paid <laughs> sure i i wouldn't try to stiff you because <clears throat> that's man you're you're a mountain of a man and a mountain of soul to go with it well thanks man you know it's an interesting thing i i you know i'll maybe take for granted some of that maybe that helps uh helps people to uh pay a little bit more attention but you know i feel like i sing and certainly these days a lot more personal and intimate uh, kind of things. And that's probably a little bit disarming to people, but maybe, I don't know. Sure. Maybe being big on stage makes them shut the fuck up for a second. Well, they might just like it. They might just like it if they shut the hell up for five seconds. You do a better job of it than anybody I've ever seen. You just, <laughs> you have that incredible ability to just captivate a group of people with the things you do. So let's talk now about your songwriting and, and some of that. So I, I want to know, you've written so many great songs through the years. What makes a good song to you? Um, like one that I've written or one that I'm listening to or either? Either one. I mean, uh, kind of a stock answer, but any song that makes you feel anything. I mean, like, you know, the heavier stuff that I listened to when I was younger and when i was inclined to uh listen to you know more aggressive rock and roll you know that's successful to me that's a, that's a good song i don't necessarily listen to it anymore things like that but you know these days it tends to be uh i mean i mentioned john moreland anybody that uh can just I, I, parsons played bass and wrote in in fifth on the floor there at the end and who you just saw playing bass with me at Southgate house. Uh, you know, he, the kinds of <laughs> songwriters that we would go see, not knowing them 
and hear a line and both of us look at each other like, holy shit, you know, tears in our eyes. That that's that's the kind of song lyrics that you instantly like. Well, shit, man, I wish I'd written that one. There goes that. That's gone. (laughs) Sure, sure. I, I, I found myself way more interested. I mean, I've all, always considered myself a songwriter and a fan of songwriters, but w- with, you know, post the band, that's really all I care about anymore. You know, I don't really care about the, there's songs on the record with no damn solos, man. You mm-hmm. know? So when you go to write a song, what is your process on that? Uh, it, there's not one, uh, uh, there's usually a, there's usually something out of thin air, uh, hopefully a whole song, but that's a rare thing, but usually there's something out of thin air. The quicker I can get that into my little, you know, my little writing app on my phone, the better. And, um, what i you know, when it's time to sit down and be disciplined and kick out material, then I try to build on that little foundation but you know I, the best songs to me the ones that felt like magic to me are the ones that you know whatever that whatever that out of the air comes from if i can keep that up you know if i need to pull over the car and and knock out a whole song those end up being the best ones or if i'm just sitting around with the guitar and i you know the ones that are kind of written in a hurry right then while whatever the hell's happening is happening nice you're you're one of the first people that i've had really give that answer that you know you want it to it, it's better when it comes out naturally quickly like that um well, I, think, I think songwriters are full of shit too man i mean my <laughs> fucking, i mean you know absolutely like i i don't think that there are a great many songwriters maybe john prine excluded who really knows what the fuck uh how they do it or what the, you know there's nothing uh, i don't know it's not it's not a big secret i think that most of us are are as dumbfounded by what we do as anybody else sure and it's it's best when it just pours out of you naturally because like you were alluding to you know relatability is is big and it's real and it's raw when it's pouring out of you like that so yeah yeah that makes that's i really like that answer yeah thanks man so you're out touring right now uh, in support of your new album. How's how's that been going? And is there a wider tour planned? Are you heading like out west or out east? What's what's going on with that? No, we're sticking still, man, and, and trying to kind of focus on quality over quantity. Um, I've I've done so much of that bar hopping over the years. Uh, you know, it just it's got to be smart. You know, that's not to say I'll go tour 10 months if it makes sense, man. I got to put food on the table, but uh, I would rather pick rooms that uh, that I enjoy, that, you know, people are cool in, that there's not a fucking, <laughs> there's not a fucking TV on the wall with ah. a game and shit like that. And uh, I, I'm just trying to right now. What what I what I had to learn a little bit the hard way over the last two years is that uh, whatever you know whatever however high up the hill we'd gotten with the band uh, I may be starting back over in a lot of ways and that's fine you know that's cool um, but I don't I don't think at thirty three you go do that playing in front of five people a night like you like I did when I was twenty three sure sure I, I totally understand you on that. And I'm telling you, people, if you get the chance, if he rolls through the area, get out and see Justin Wells because you will not be disappointed. <laughs> They're going to see me. So, I, I ain't hiding. So we talked a little bit about your thoughts on the current state of country music earlier. Let's get a little more in depth in that. How do you think things are progressing in country music? I think that, uh, you know, man... I, I, this the same thing can be said about country as as any other music um or or really outside of music i mean even you know getting into politics which i'm not i'm not going to do but my point is that just uh i think that there are there are fewer and fewer and smaller and smaller stones for these snakes and these assholes to hide under and 
um, in turn, there's a bigger and bigger light uh, available to shine on anybody that wants to work on it, you know? And uh, uh, we were kind of talking about Americana and outlaw and all that shit earlier. You know, that, that was stuff that was bestowed on musicians by non-musicians profiting off their backs. And it's kind of becoming outdated, man, and outmoded because, you know, here we are, it's the Spotify, it's the playlist, it's the singles, it's, it's however people want to consume music. And look, man, I mean, if you're listening to me right now, listen to my record from, the beginning to the ending uh if you're so inclined but really listen to it however the hell you want it you know if you bought it just listen to it <laughs> you know sure so sure. it doesn't have to be all neatly packaged and deluxe edition bullshit uh and so that's why you know in this conversation struggle to define what americana is or whatever because that stuff never mattered anyway so uh i guess my long-winded answer is you know I think that, and I hope it's not just temporary, but it certainly seems to me that real music is having its payday again, and and uh, I'd be blessed to be considered in that, you know? Sure. I, I've been saying, and, and I've seen it just here within the last six months, you know, the, the support for the non-corporate music has increased so much people you said it it's the spotify it's the playlist age you know it's it's really a great time right now to to be a fan of music because there is so much you can access so easily and you can find exactly what you want and i know it's it's definitely a great thing for guys like you you know you're you're releasing your solo album and it's never been as easy for people to get their hands on it as it is right now. So there's no, you know, we, we made a conscious decision early in this process to remove as many, you know, as many people between, you know, me and you or me and anybody that's trying to hear this as possible. You know, we had some options that, that did not seem favorable. So, you know, the, the bad side is I don't suppose any of us are going to be flying on jets, <laughs> but that's okay, man. The good side of it is it's a lot easier for me to find, you know, Joe Blow in, in central Iowa who likes my music and getting that to him, you know? Sure, sure. It's definitely, definitely a fun time to be a music fan right now, and that's, that's not going to stop anytime soon. I, I think... The artist, you, I've always said you can't stop talent, and that's more true now than it ever has been. I think you're right, man. I, yeah, I, I don't think. Yeah, I don't. I don't think anything new has necessarily happened to music. I think that stuff that's been happening for a long time and has been somewhat suppressed, they, that uh, they can't really suppress it anymore. I mean, the you know the guys who are really enjoying a lot of success right now that have a lot of truth behind your Stapletons and your Sturgils and your is bulls and, and all these cats, you know, this stuff is not new necessarily. They might be, but that kind of music is not new. They've just, you know, some of those cats kick, you know, kick down their own doors and some of them had doors maybe politely moved for them or whatever. But the point is like, you know, going back to the political climate, man, and people are sick of the same old shit. It's, mm -hmm. it's across the board. I feel like in, in this country anyway, uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think, I think that, um, <laughs> with record label bullshit and, and entrenched political bullshit, it, it's all, uh, it's bad. <laughs> we need to put faith in, in, you know, sure. the, the guy, I suppose. It's, it's, it's such a great age. So when you get in the car to, to go and pick up music for your daughters, or pick up milk for your daughters, I'm sorry. Picking up music for them, too. About, about as much of, of both. <laughs> Who's on your radio? Are you listening to the FM radio? You pop in a CD, iPod? What, what are you listening to? If it's just me, man, I tell you, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I don't really listen to a lot of music anymore. And, and I have to say, uh, I've never, I don't suppose I've ever really said that this has been an influence, but, uh, uh, the, the WTF podcast with Mark Marin had, had a large bit in, uh, me kind of, uh, 
redeveloping a healthy perspective on my career choices. Really? As I was kind of slumping a little bit in that, you know, um, it's just a real, I don't know. It's a really personal podcast kind of thing. And, you know, I used to drive, I used to be in a van with six other people and now being on, on the road by myself a lot more, I don't know, listen to music all the time, but I like to listen to people talking. But, uh, as far as music, man, uh, and especially, uh, down here at the bottom of this totem pole, it seems like all of my friends are releasing records this year. And, uh, so most of the stuff I'm listening to are our buddies that come through, you know, the Matt Woods is and the Jeff Shepherds and the Chris Stockups and the big shows. I think big shows have the album of the year this year. Okay. I'll have to look into some of those. I, I, I know, uh, Matt Woods. Um, so how did you get into podcast? I mean, that's, <laughs> you've, you've kind of mesmerized me Matt, again. How did Matt that- got <laughs> well, you know, Woods Matt Woods is 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 like my road brother, man, and, and Matt's done a lot of solo touring over the years, infinitely more than me, all over the country. And uh I don't know. That's kind of he he had suggested a couple of podcasts, not that one specifically, but a couple of others, and I stumbled across that one and that was that, man, you know? Huh. That's very interesting. I was I was not expecting that at all. <laughs> So oh, it, even my, my presets, man, on, in my car on the satellite radio are, are it's, you know, the first one's outlaw country and the second one is forties jazz. I mean, <laughs> and the, and the third one's a comedy channel. Very, very diverse. I've picked that up from your Facebook posts. Very diverse. And that's, yeah. that's not a bad thing at all. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so you've got your album out and I, I know, it's still early, but what's the future looking like for Justin Wells? I think good, man. I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. We did, uh, there's just, there's just a ton of people that have supported this thing before they knew the title, before they heard a single song. You know, we did a pledge music campaign, which I've been wary of in the past. And, you know, I'm not saying I'd never do it again. I'd like to be in a position, not do it again. Um, but, I think it, I think it's good. I mean, this is regardless, this is this album and and going forward is built on honesty first. And, uh, I don't know, just, just kind of trying to be an open book as a person, as an artist. That sounds great to me. Yeah. I think it's going to be, I think everything's going to be all right, man. Justin, I want to thank you for joining us again. It's been a blast. Thanks for having me. If you have a chance to get out and see Justin Wells, get out and see him. If you got a chance, buy his album. Just where can they get your album? Uh, JustinWellsMusic.com, and I'm on iTunes, Amazon. Uh, if you do the Spotify jam, I'm on Spotify. Um, video already out on YouTube. Another one coming. Uh, at my damn show. <laughs> exactly. That's the best place. At my damn show, and vinyl's on its way. Oh, vinyl. I have I was just telling Nick Dittmeyer last week, I've started collecting vinyl, but I haven't got my player yet, mainly because I don't have space for it. I, I'm going to have to get me one of those when they come out. When are they going to be out? I'll make sure I, I get it to you, man. Uh, uh, late September is the last update. You know, unfortunately, uh, demand is much higher than supply with these press and plants, and, and my name's not Jack White. I'm the other JW. So, <laughs> well, I go- <laughs> last call. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and we're going to give away two autographed CDs of Justin's new album, Down, uh, Dawn in the Distance, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to give those away to two people who help share and like the post on Facebook with this interview in it. And we will announce the winners of that at a later date. Going to have a giveaway. Someone's going to come away with a great CD. Uh, Justin, thanks again for joining us. This has been the Country Music Armadillo Show.